All right, so this is the die hard philosophy fans, huh? <laughs> okay. I hope sure you're very hundred doctors before you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so she would have been here otherwise. Okay, good. We'll catch her up next week then. Uh, I hope you all had a good holiday. And it's been a month since we talked. Uh, today is our seventh seminar. The Great Mystery Explained Quantum Philosophy, Neuroscience, and Dualist Interaction. So we'll bring everything up to date today. Um, and we're going to go on the timeline from quantum philosophy to dualist interactionism. Now, the course materials um, are still out on the website in case you want to download them. If you want to bring a, a zip drive, uh, not a zip drive, a jump drive, next week I'll have everything ready for that. Okay? Or if you want me to make a CD, just let me know. Okay? Uh, the uh, seminar will conclude next week on Monday, December 3rd. And that'll be our eighth and final seminar. All right, <clears throat> just a um, question and answer session for the seminars one through six. These are the main topics that we've covered. We covered the ancient mystery religions, and we select them because that's where this all begins. Um, our investigation as human beings into the nature of reality begins with the ancient mystery religions. And they go as far back as humankind goes. We can trace them back to about 6,000 BCE with documentation. We can trace them further back, you know, through inference and implication based on archaeological findings. Um, it is possible to find, for example, uh, shrines with skulls in them as far back as 12,000 BCE. Um, and so we're assuming that that was some kind of a religious ritual. Uh, intended to contact the spirits of the dead ancestors. Um, but as far as written documentation, we can go back to 6000 BCE, and that's where we start to get these ancient mystery religions. They flourish uh, around 4000 BCE, um, and they're still active today. We still have practitioners of the ancient mystery religions today in the, the, you know, the hermetic societies, the people who, who still use the Golden Dawn method, the people who still use the Arum Solus method, uh, the um, Ordo Tempi Orientis is still out there operating. So, you know, the New Age groups are still out there, and they have bits and pieces of the ancient mystery religions. So we can base our understanding of the ancients on the material that has come to us from that ancient time. And the, in the important thing about the ancient mystery religions was that they discovered through the practices of hypnosis meditation ritual that our experience is that there are two different kinds of things going on here. There is the soul thing going on here, and then there is the extended world thing, the material thing. And they represented the quest for knowledge in myths about descent to the underworld and then back again with knowledge from those entities who were in that spiritual realm of the underworld. So all of the myths that we have coming to us from that time as teaching tales um, instruct us to basically practice death, leave the body, travel in the spirit realm, come back, and then relate what it is that we discovered there. All right? Now the pre-Socratics are, are all initiates in the ancient mystery religions. They've all grown up in that. They're all... Um, practitioners of the hypnosis, the ritual, the meditation, they know all the myths, but one of the things they want to do is they want to begin moving away from mythological structures and moving towards what we would consider to be scientific structures. Not only for the purposes of investigation, but also for the purposes of education, so that they can teach more people this kind of uh, information. And so they begin to move away from the ancient myth-making ancient mystery religion um, concept towards the concept of a science and the concept of a true philosophy, which uh, arises between ancient Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Now, in Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, we still have initiates into the ancient mysteries. All three of them were initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries. And so they still have access to all of that 
um, earlier information, all of the misstructures, all of the practices of hypnosis, meditation, and ritual. Uh, but now, Greek science and Greek language and the concepts of philosophy have evolved to the point where they can begin to start classifying experiences according to the natural laws which they follow. And so from that point on, in the Western tradition, we begin to see a movement towards science and away from religion. Okay? Still the same concept. There's two things out there. There's two worlds. There's the world of the one, which is the spiritual world, and the world of the many, from the pre-Socratics. There's the way, the path of, of, of truth, which is the path of the spirit world, and there's the path of opinion, which is the path of all that stuff out there. Okay? There's the world of being, according to Plato, and the world of becoming. So there's still this dualism that um, is embedded in the philosophical ideas that they are now presenting to us. These ideas will then be taken up by the Gnostics and the early Christians to create um, a, a sort of amalgam of the ancient mystery religions and the new modern Greek scientific conception of the, of the world. And what we get from the Gnostics and the early Christians are myth structures, stories about people like Jesus and John the Baptist and other people like that who are practitioners of the ancient mystery religions, okay, uh, meditation, hypnosis, ritual, who understand what it is to be able to separate the soul from the body and practice death, as Socrates told us we should do, and who then come back with a story, um, a, a, the gospel, which if you recall, Godspell means the good news, okay, that they then want to present to everyone. So they continue this uh, sort of uh, democratic kind of an idea that, the, that Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle had started, that we want to take this mystery kind of stuff and make it available to everyone, to the entire world. And so the Gnostics and the early Christians took that idea and they ran with it. And they were presenting this in very simple terms, very easy terms. They teach you how to do it. They teach you how to meditate. They te teach you how to do um, hypnosis. They teach you how to do the rituals. And from that, you will gain the same experience as all of these other people have, that there are these two kinds of things going on, and that you are now free to move in the spirit world and go out and uh, gain all the knowledge and experience from that place and bring it back here. OK? The central myth of the early Christians, of course, was the Jesus myth, and Jesus is, is, of course, an avatar, and that is what we are talking about here. We're talking about the merging of a soul with this kind of a structure here, a body, and, and uh, that was what they were talking about in the Jesus myth, um, which they were also talking about on the eastern side with, you know, all the avatars of the ancient Hindu gods. Okay? Any questions about that so far? So remember, we're tracing this idea, this dualistic idea, from its very beginnings until the present day. That's what we want to keep, it, keep our, our eyes on, is that idea of dualism, as it is expanded and modified over the centuries. Okay, we pass from the early Christians to René Descartes in the 17th century. And here we now have the first solid scientific foundation for a philosophy uh, that is now building upon Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle's framework. And Descartes basically um, now takes all of the, all of the history that, that uh, occurred up until his time and distills it down to a conception of two separate substances. Those two substances which he said comprise the universe are the extended substance of the material world and the thinking substance of the interior world, the mental world, the spiritual world, the consciousness world. Okay? And he's saying these are two separate things and they are substances which we can now begin to investigate scientifically to find out what their properties and laws are. Alright? Now, Spinoza, Leibniz, Barclay, Hume, and Kant are all responding to this new idea that Descartes has presented them. Spinoza says, I agree basically with what you're trying to say, but I don't like the idea of a dualism. I don't like this idea that there's these two substances out there because that 
you know, then we have to explain how this non-material kind of soul thing can have any kind of a direct influence on this material body thing. And he said, that is an insurmountable problem. And always has been. So he said, I'm going to resolve that problem by basically um, taking uh, a, a, a leaf out of the notebook of our Eastern philosophical friends, the Buddhists, and basically claim that all of this is in fact only one substance, and that substance is mental, it's spiritual, and it is the substance of the mind of God. So even though our experience is of this dualism, in fact, we are just simply actors in this great theater that is constructed and maintained by the mind of God. And everything, therefore, is this divine kind of thought. So that was his way around that particular difficulty. <clears throat> a creative way, okay? Um, uh, Leibniz comes along and says, that is not a solution because we must not specifically rely on uh, you know, this kind of nebulous concept of the mind of God because it sort of is outside of our experience. And since we're now focused on what is going on right here, right now, in a scientific investigation, we had better come up with a better theory that can explain this. So what he did was he said, we are each of us a consciousness, a monad. And that monad is windowless. And we are controlled and uh, harmonized and synchronized with every other windowless monad out there by the mind of God. <laughs> okay, so we have we have we have the um, the description of the experience that Descartes is saying. Descartes is saying the only thing I can be certain of is the fact that I exist and that I am having these experiences. I cannot, however, under any circumstances, make any existential claims about the experience. Only that I'm having it. I can't make any ex any existential claim about the chair or the people or the air, or anything else out there. All I can say, and be truthful, is that I know I exist, and I am having the present experience of standing here, looking at the chairs, looking at the people, and having this conversation. Okay? I cannot go beyond that and say that the chair exists, that the room exists, that you exist. All I can say is that you're elements of my experience. So this is why Leibniz is coming up with this windowless monad. Because he agrees with Descartes. That is, in fact, our experience. And we can't really go beyond that unless we postulate some way of getting, you know, outside of the windowless monad. And we can't do that from our own experience. So we have to hypothesize something like the mind of God that would be external to us and synchronize everything. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? Remember, they're still, they're still having the same experience as the ancient mystery religion people. All right, they're just now updating it and trying to investigate it in scientific, in a scientific way. Okay, Barclay comes along and says, yeah, 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 yeah. Descartes' <laughs> right, Spinoza's right, Leibniz is right. Um, but I want to take it one step further and just say that um, we don't need the mind of God involved here as much as we need the mind of the person who's doing the perceiving. Okay? To be is to be perceived. And so he's saying it's an idealism, okay, that is, that it's all spirit, it's all mind, but it's the mind of the observer that creates all of this stuff. Okay? Now, this, this is going way out in left field, uh, with absolutely no support at the time. He has no support for this. He has no support from the philosophical community, and he has no support from the scientific community, because he's way off in left field talking about this kind of stuff. Um, however, in modern times, Barclay's ideas have been very instrumental in leading us to certain conclusions in neuroscience and certain conclusions in the philosophy and uh, psychology of perception. So he was having an experience too, but it was so far left of everybody else, or right of everybody else, or off wherever he was, <laughs> that it was beyond their experience. And so they sort of just pushed him aside and deal with it very much. Okay? Hume comes along and says, wow, if everything that Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and Barclay are saying is true, we have a big problem because we cannot then claim any certain knowledge whatsoever because we are limited to what we experience 
and that limited experience does not permit us to make any kind of real um, a priori, that is, you know, provable before the fact, kinds of conclusions about the nature of reality. All we can say is what we're experiencing right now and what we remember experiencing yesterday and the day before. That's it. We can't go beyond that to any kind of laws. We can't go beyond that to any kind of anything except just this pattern of repetition, which may end. Okay? So causality goes out the window. We have no, no way of proving any kind of a causal relationship among any of our experiences. And with that, with causality gone, basically the whole edifice of metaphysics and philosophy falls. Because if we don't have any certain knowledge of things as basic as causality, we can't argue about anything. All we can do is provide simple descriptions of what we are experiencing right now. So this is another criticism of Descartes, but it's not a criticism in the sense that he thinks Descartes is wrong. He's saying Descartes right, and because he's right, we're in trouble because we can't make any claims about, um, you know, about universal laws. Okay, does that make sense? Because all we can all we can say is, you know, we've had all of these experiences, and people have written them down, and there appear to be all of these patterns that happen, but those patterns could change tomorrow. And the fact that something happens here, and we call it, you know, A. And then a little bit later, something happens and we call it B. There's no way we can causally link these two. They're linked in time. One precedes the other. But there may be no way to prove that they're causally related. Even if we have a series of a million of these linkages, the next time we perform this experiment, it may fail. OK? So he is anticipating quantum mechanics, which is where we'll get to in a little while in today's seminar. He's saying, what we can only have is probabilistic knowledge and not certain knowledge. There is a high probability that the sun will rise tomorrow. Okay? There is a high probability that sometime this winter we'll get a snowstorm. But beyond that, we cannot go. Okay? So Hume is uh, the ultimate skeptic at this point. And he's, he's not saying he's a skeptic because he disputes all of these people. He's saying he's a skeptic because all of these people are absolutely correct. Okay? And because we have this dualistic nature, because we are this, this you know, thinking substance that is peering at the universe through the eyes of this material substance, we have limited knowledge. Okay, so Kant reads Hume and all these other people, and he says, wow, Descartes's right, they're all right, and Hume is especially right. We are in deep trouble, and if we can't solve this problem, philosophy is dead. Okay, reduced to nothing but descriptions of experience and probabilistic, you know, uh, theories about the way things work. So he said, let's take a look at, uh, at, at Hume's solution to this. And Hume, remember, said that there must be a psychological reason why we believe these things, even though we can't prove them. Why we believe in causality, even though we can't prove them. And so he's suggesting that is because of the nature of the mind. It has to have these kinds of categories, says Kant like causation, like space, like time. Otherwise, its experience would be meaningless. So this is the way, says Hume, that we organize our experience according to these beliefs. Kant comes along and says, I think I can demonstrate that they're more than just simple beliefs. He says, I think I can demonstrate that they are absolutely necessary features of the way that human beings are, an essential feature of the way human beings operate. And so he came up with these ideas of these categories, which which um, organize, filter, and uh, transmit all of that probabilistic data out there that we then perceive um, in Descartes' cogito, in that, you know, in that interaction between the thinking substance and the extended form. Okay? And so he said, I think I've set us back on, on, a, on a firm foundation where we can again make, make some claims, at least, about having certain knowledge besides the certain knowledge that I exist and I've, that I've had in these experiences. Knowledge that goes out into the extended world out there and makes claims that can be verified as true, as certain, about things out there in the real world. Okay, the extended world. Um, Hegel and Nietzsche are the first of the, of the uh, overtly political philosophers since Plato. We don't really have a lot of politics involved in the philosophies we're having here. They're still concerned with ontology. 
they are still concerned mostly with what is the nature of the relationship between thinking substance and, and external world, you know, extended substance. And how do we demonstrate that? How do we describe it? How do we prove it? And what are the implications of that? So that's what they've been doing for the last, uh, you know, 2,000 years or so, okay, when Hegel and Nietzsche come along. Now, Hegel, and Hegel particularly is no longer concerned as much with the questions of ontology. He is concerned with the questions of, of how we act and behave in a world where consciousness does have these features. Okay? And he's also concerned with an overarching organizing principle. Okay? For, for Kant, the organizing principle for knowledge is the category. For Hegel, the organizing principle of life is history. All right? He says, everything that happens to us is because of historical forces. Because there is a history here. And it is not just a history made up of dis, dis, you know, disconnected facts. It is a living, breathing history with its own consciousness. And we are living in that. So this is his conception of the mind of God. The mind of God, if we take a look at it, is in fact all of history. And it's moving towards a goal. It has an end. It has an objective. And that objective is the total freedom of all human beings. Okay? So that was what Hegel was talking about. Now, he says that um, the way that this historical force operates may, may be really bloody and nasty as it moves towards its ultimate end. He said, but that's necessary because that's the way that history operates. Okay? It has to destroy the old in order to make room for the new. And so there's this constant oscillation between the old and the new, the destruction and the creation. So this is, a, this is an idea coming right out of the Hindus. Okay? Krishna, the god of destruction. Shiva. Krishna and Shiva. Sorry, Shiva is the goddess of, the goddess of destruction. Krishna is the god of creation. Okay? And so, you know, destroy, create, destroy, create, destroy the old, create the new on the ashes of the, of the old. And so that's what he's saying history is. It is a never-ending oscillation of this kind of a dialectical process. And so it is messy and bloody from our perspective, but it is leading towards an end goal which will leave the, the people in the future in a much better position than we are. So he, he's talking about progress. He's actually suggesting that there is metaphysical progress because all of history is directed towards this one goal, and all of history together will be the mind of God. Who is the God of destruction? Shiva and Krishna. Shiva? Shiva. Shiva? Shiva. In the S ancient Hindu temple. S-H-I-V-A? S-H-I-V-A. Yes. Okay? Then we come to Nietzsche. Now, Nietzsche is a Gnostic. <laughs> He's an unrepentant Gnostic, okay? He is also the inheritor of all of this other stuff, all the way from the beginning, all the way to the, to the present time, which for him, for him was the 19th century. And he begins to take a look at all of this, and he says, I think Hegel's right. I think we've been moving towards a specific goal. But that goal is not the freedom of mankind. That goal is the destruction and enslavement of mankind. Okay? And he talks about all of these things that are happening as a result of the fact that the scientific world created by the Western philosophers have now placed in the hands of tyrannical leaders weapons of mass destruction through which they can reshape the face of the planet. This is in the 19th century. Okay? Now, remember, he was, a, he was a, a, an officer during the, um, uh, the, uh, the War of 1844, the Crimean War. So it was a war between, basically, Germany and Russia. And it was bloody, and it was nasty, and it had all of these new weapons, cannon, you know, Gatling guns. It had all of these nasty things that were very good at killing many, many people all at once. Okay? So he is using his imagination to, to fast forward that 
and imagine what the kinds of weapons of mass destruction will be available in 100 or 150 or 200 years. And he's thinking that that, that does not lead, as Hegel said, to the freedom of mankind, but in fact to the enslavement of mankind. A global tyranny. And so he is now preaching against that. And he is suggesting that there are two sources of, um, there are two reasons why this tyranny is allowed to continue. The first is because the, uh, the institutionalization of organized religion has sapped men and in, of, their, of, their, uh, of their link to, to God, okay? And it has replaced it with worship of the state, basically, is what he's suggesting. Okay? In other words, that, that all institutionalized religions have become instruments of the state, and they don't lead us to the, to the ground of being anymore. Instead, they lead us to worship of the state itself. So he has a number of deconstructions, a number of criticisms of, of Christianity as it was practiced in the, in the 19th century. Um, and uh, they're very incisive. Okay, so he said that's one thing that's happened. And so well, what's happened is we've become subservient because we're, we're taught this by our religions. And we're not paying attention to what's really going on out there because our religions tell us not to. And he's all religions. I mean, he, he deconstructs Christianity specifically because that's what he is most familiar with. But he also uh, links this criticism to all institutionalized religions. So that's the first problem, he says, that happens. The second problem is that the crowd, okay, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, path of opinion out there has uh, been so conditioned that it will not permit anyone to rise above it to be a leader and lead them away from it. Okay, because he says what happens is, and he's capitalizing on another thing that Hegel talked about, the, the master-slave relationship. He is suggesting that this master-slave relationship is at the heart of everything, is at the heart of the difficulty. Uh, the master, for Hegel, the master and slave relationship is an unstable one. All right, and it is, it is um, uh, founded upon hatred, violence, and resentment. Okay, the master resents, hates, and reviles the servant, the slave, because they are slavish, and the slave, of course, hates, reviles, and uh, you know is disgusted with the master because the master is inhuman. Okay, so there's this constant uh, tension between the two classes. <clears throat> Nietzsche says that this is worse than even that because that's a political institution. He's saying this is a spiritual problem. He's saying that the mass of men are so conditioned as to be resentful, he talks about resentment, resentima, okay, of anybody who tries to break out, anybody who tries to show them a different path. They will literally pull them down and trample them underfoot. And he has this great metaphor, this great image in uh, in Vespic Zarathustra, where Zarathustra is watching a tightrope walker, um, and he can see the crowd underneath the tightrope walker, and the tightrope walker is, you know, 100 feet above walking the tightrope, and the crowd is, is, is making statements to the fact that they want this tightrope walker to fall. So this is the visual imagery. The crowd below, you know, wishing, sending all of their psychic energy upward to drag the tightrope walker down to their level and smash it on the rocks below the rope. And so, Nietzsche talks about this as the spirit of gravity, as his metaphor. Humankind is immersed and enmeshed and enslaved by the spirit of gravity, and so it's very difficult to break free of that. Very few people can do it. Only the overman has the resources necessary to break free of this. So what we have in Thus Spake Zarathustra is a Gnostic myth, a Gnostic parable, where he uses this concept of over and under again and again to, to talk about this dialectical tension between the crowd, the mass, the spirit of gravity, and the person, the philosopher, the overman who wishes to transcend it, to overcome it, the spirit of gravity, and to rise. And he talks, yeah? Are you saying overman? Overman. 
Now this was translated, mistranslated early on as Superman. The, the, the German word is Übermensch, which literally is overman. Okay, and he's, remember, it's over and under. It's up and down. He's, he's making this distinction between the two, you know, the two directions. So overman is the proper, because it's a transliteration of Übermensch, which is the proper way of thinking about this. It's the overman. However, we get the concept sort of, sort of in a really twisted eugenics way from people like um, 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 who wrote Man and Superman? Uh, oh, I'll think of his name in just a second. I had it just a few seconds ago. Anyway, he writes a play. Um, oh, George Bernard Shaw. He writes a play called Man and Superman, where he's talking about this kind of thing here. And he's suggesting that it's a eugenics concept. He's suggesting that, yeah, the race needs to improve, and in order to do that, we've got to get rid of all these inferior beings. Okay, now that's not what Nietzsche was talking about. Nietzsche was saying, all of us need to become overbearing, overcome the spirit of gravity, okay, and escape, basically, from, you know, the tyranny that is descending upon us, which will be never-ending and, you know, impossible to bear, okay? He also talked about eternal recurrence. Um, uh, which was his way of sort of, you know, giving us um, an idea of what we're up against. Because this is his version of the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus, remember, was condemned forever to roll the rock up the hill, only to have it roll back down. So for eternity, he was rolling this rock up the hill and then having to walk down and get it again and back up. That's, that is a pretty good description from the ancients about the monotony of our everyday existence. And for Nietzsche, he just sort of expanded that and said, what if, you know, what if we were like Sisyphus and everything that's happening right now is going to happen an infinite number of times? How would you feel about that? And of course, the answer of the overman is, not a problem, because I'm going to get stronger rolling that rock up the hill. Okay? So anyway, so Nietzsche, that's what Nietzsche is talking about. Now, Hans Weinger, uh, I introduced him simply because he is a neo-Kantian who wants to talk about all of the categories that Kant proposed. He's suggesting they're all fictions. They're not real. It's just a fiction. It's a way, it's a, a concept that we use in order to understand things. And so he has this whole book, The Philosophy of As If, which outlines the uh, very powerful and very entrenched and ingrained fictions by which we are governed. Okay? Uh, space, time, all the categories. Space, time are all fictions. Okay, they're categories that we use to, you know, to understand and to describe our experience. Um, the concept of a corporation is a legal fiction. Okay, a corporation is in fact a, a non-living person according to the law. It can buy things, it can sell things, it can own things, it can have bank accounts, it can do all these things that a person could do, okay, even though it's not a person. <laughs> so that's, that's an example of a legal fiction, okay? We respond to these legal fictions all the time, okay? The, the stoplights that we have, they're completely legal fictions, because there's nothing physically stopping us from running through a red light. Only the fiction that we assume that it's time to stop the car, you know, we, we obey the fiction. Okay, even if we don't have to. I mean, you know, sometimes the lights in Pocatello will, will, will get off and you'll sit at, a, at an intersection <laughs> through several cycles. So it's late at night, the cycles are going, there's no one coming, how many of us will just sit there waiting for the damn thing to turn green? <laughs> okay, because we are ensorcelled by these legal fictions. There's other fictions. You know, geometric fiction. There's fictions in, you know, in science, all of these things. So I highly recommend the philosophy of as if to investigate all of these fictions because he lays it out. Kind of a hard read because, you know, he's a German philosopher right at the end of the 19th century, so he's really worried. Okay? Edwin Husserl um, is the heir to Descartes. He is now going all the way back to Descartes saying we've lost our way again. We have forgotten what it is that's fundamental about philosophy. And that is the distinction uh, that Descartes set up, which is the thinking substance and 
the extended substance, and the relationship that we have in the way we're describing that. Okay? We've come through all of these things. We've come through, you know, Spinoza, Leibniz, Barclay, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, Feinger, and the others. You know, there's a bunch of them. Um, and we're no closer to, to having a solid science of philosophy based on Descartes' insight than we were, you know, 300 years ago, basically. So he's saying we need to reevaluate that. And he said we need to take a look at what, what is going on here. And he introduces a couple of new concepts to help us get there. And, one, and what he calls his uh, new philosophical system, he calls it phenomenology. And he says what we are, what, what Descartes was trying to tell us is that we have to learn how to describe the phenomena that we as thinking substances encounter in our experience. So we have to do that. We have to abandon the quest at this point for certain knowledge of the existence of those things which we are experiencing as phenomena and just step back a bit and allow ourselves simply to accumulate a bunch of descriptions. Because it's in the describing that we begin to understand how this process works. Okay? So he's saying that this is what we have to do as philosophers. Now, let's go back, all the way back to Socrates. Socrates said a philosopher practices death. And one of the ways that the philosopher does that is by separating consciousness from the body. Okay, separating the thinking substance, the thinking substance which we are, from the avatar, and hanging out in this world of ideas, in the world of being, in the world of the spirit. Over in the East, the Buddha is, is giving us precise instructions on how to do that through meditation, um, <coughs> calming the body, entering into a state of psychophysiological coherence, and then distancing ourselves, you know, by stages from the experience of the avatar and its relationship to the external world. So that was the Buddha's description of how to do it. Now we fast forward. Descartes is saying, basically, we're going to do that with our eyes open, and we're going to do it by focusing on those things out there, and by doubting them, we will come to the same conclusion. So rather than distance ourselves from it in a meditative state, we will engage ourselves with those things in the external world, and we will come to the same conclusion, namely that the only thing that I'm sure that exists is my spiritual being, the thinking substance which I am. Not by removing myself from this, but by engaging myself with that. Okay? Because if I focus on that out there, and I begin to try to understand, you know, what it is that I'm experiencing, pretty soon it will become obvious that there are these two things. That and me. Whatever that is. Okay? And we're making no claims about what that is. Absolutely no claims at all now with phenomenology. We're making no claims about what that is. We're only saying, it's out there, I'm here, and I'm going to describe it. So the uh, Husserl is taking us back to Descartes' method in order to purify all of this other stuff that's happened between Descartes and Husserl. Because everybody back there is, is really attempting really hard to try to get back to having all of these you know, real things out there. And remember, the humans already demonstrated that that's really impossible. Trump tried it, you know, he came up with a solution, but it wasn't a good one. I mean, I wouldn't want to say that. It was very valuable, but it didn't solve the problem. Okay? It gave us more insight into how to do this, but it didn't solve the real problem. So Husserl was saying, let's abandon the problem as an unsolvable problem. Let's stop beating our heads against this wall and just step back and say, there are these two substances, me, that, and begin to describe it, and maybe we'll make headway that way. So what he is suggesting is that we do exactly what Descartes did, only instead of doubting it in the sense of you know, being skeptical about whether it's you know, knowable or not, he's suggesting what we do is we suspend judgment about its reality. The only thing I know is real is me, and everything else is, a, is an aspect of my experience. Whether it's real or not is irrelevant. Real. Okay? Yeah? Is there a book that you might re recommend that I might possibly understand about how the brain perceives 
Yes, we'll get to that. Yeah, we will definitely get to that. Definitely we'll get to that in just a few minutes, actually. Okay? So, Husserl is now suggesting that the phenomenological method of suspending our, our belief in the reality of that stuff and dropping back and just taking a, a position that this is the experience I'm having and, and being you know, happy with that, uh, that's the phenomenological method. Okay? Wittgenstein suggests the same approach from a linguistic perspective. He suggests that we can do the same thing by analyzing the language. Because the structure of the language, according to Aristotle and others, has a logical, necessary relationship to whatever it is out there. So if we can understand the structure of the language, we can therefore understand the structure of what the language is talking about. So he's suggesting let's take a look at the language. Husserl is saying let's take a look at the phenomena. Wittgenstein is saying, let's take a look at the language, which is describing the phenomenon. Maybe that'll get us a bit closer, too. Yeah? Is that what Confucius was doing in trying to define everything, or was he just totally into the mundane? No, no, he was, this, yeah, basically the same kind of thing. But also, you remember, Aristotle did exactly the same thing. Because we need a classification system if we are going to have any hope of understanding the regularities, the laws. So let's just begin to look at all of those regularities. So Aristotle did exactly what he did, it developed this hierarchical system of, you know, genus, species, whatever, classification of that. Um, Confucius is doing exactly the same kind of a thing. He wants to see the regularities. So let's describe them. Okay, and then Wittgenstein is saying, let's, we've now got this bunch of descriptions, let's take a look at the structure of the language that we're using to describe these phenomena, and maybe that will give us additional clues about what's really going on here. Okay, so yeah, all of these people are living in exactly the same world as we are, and they're following the same kind of a path because they all know one way or another how to separate consciousness from, you know, from the extended world. One way or another, whether it's through direct meditation, like in the ancients, up to Descartes, or and Descartes would have learned this too because he was an alchemist, okay? Or, if it is uh, Descartes now proposing this new method of doing exactly the same thing, or um, Husserl suggesting the same method of doing the same thing. Okay? It doesn't matter whether we distance ourselves from it and hang out in the realm of being, that will demonstrate that we're the thinking substance and that's the extended world over there. Or, by focusing on our relationship to the extended world, we can come to the same conclusion. Because we're always run up against the same experience, namely that the only thing I'm certain of is my own existence. And the, the reason why is because that is different than the rest of that. It's completely independent of all of this. Okay? And that's why we have that experience. Whether we do meditation classically, whether we do Descartes' um, a, you know, suspension of, of belief, or whether we do Husserl's suspension of uh, existential claims. Either way, any way we look at it, that's, we're going to have the same experience. And thus prove the same thing, namely that there are these two things. And we are the only thing about which we are certain. Okay? Heidegger was a student of Husserl's and wanted, to, he was, you know, he wanted to, to come up with a method of, of describing this whole interaction between consciousness and that out there. Uh, without ever using the word consciousness, okay? Because he he wanted he wanted to say consciousness cannot exist independently of that out there. Consciousness is always consciousness of some external object. Without an external object, consciousness does not exist. Okay, so he's saying let's stop let's stop talking about dualism. Let's start talking about interaction here. And so he wanted to describe that. Um, he did not like Husserl's philosophy because it led back to an idealism. All of these philosophies lead back to idealism one way or another. They always lead back to the starting point that the only thing we're certain of is our own existence, and that because our own existence is different from everything else out there. It is different. It has a different you know, dimension. It's completely different than all of this stuff out there. Heidegger did not like this idealistic bent 
So he's saying let's abandon the, you know, the concept of idealism altogether and just talk about consciousness of something and whatever that happens to be. He called that Dasein, being there. You are always there in a world experiencing objects. Without objects, no experience. So let's get rid of all this idealism. However, he failed. Being in time was his masterwork. He was supposed to have three sections, like I said. The first section on the phenomenological method, the second section on the actual descriptions of the phenomenological experiences, and the third section on how all of that is related to time. But the minute he started to analyze it with respect to time, he was inevitably forced into an idealistic position. <laughs> so he abandoned it, didn't write it, and spent the rest of his life, you know, being frustrated because he couldn't get away from the idealism that he so despised. Okay? It doesn't matter where you start, it doesn't matter which end you look at, it doesn't matter which method you use, you always end up in an idealistic position. Okay? Sartre, being in nothingness is sort of the poor man's being in time. Um, it's a little bit easier to read. Um, um, he was a student of Heidegger's Anthocerl, so he knows about that. And then we just talked about the New Age Hermeticists, um, just to sort of take our link from the modern day back to the ancient mystery religions so we can take a look at that and see how we can know so much about those ancient mystery religions because all of that has survived up to the present time and is still being used to this day. We can still do it. If we wanted to have exactly the same experience that our ancient ancestors had, we can go take a look at the works of the Golden Dawn, practice the rituals, well, we'll have the same experience that the ancients had, exactly the same experience. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, everybody pretty much up to speed? Child. <clears throat>